question for us. Thank you very much. And if you want to just make me host again. Thank you. Okay, I will just, let me just uh, organize my screens and we'll start off with the presentation. Okay, right. So, thank you very much uh, for everyone to come in to this local plan update webinar. Uh, we're coming to the end of our series of webinars now. Um, so if you joined a few of the others, welcome back. Uh, but if this is your first one, uh, you're very welcome. We hope you find it useful. Uh, this particular webinar is focused on the flood risk topic um, and it's an opportunity for you to hear a short presentation and ask questions of the team. Uh, before we begin the webinar properly, um, I'd like to outline a few of the housekeeping arrangements uh, for this session um, and to explain some of the format as well. So uh, first and foremost, please note that this webinar is being recorded and uh, will be uploaded publicly on YouTube for the benefit of others. Um, and that's primarily for those who aren't able to attend today um, and will but will be able to watch the recording. And obviously you'll be welcome to watch the recording too. Um, all attendee microphones and videos have been turned off. Uh, and will remain turned off. Um, to ask questions, please use the Q&A function, uh, which should be at the bottom of your screen, or that may be on the top, depending on how your layout looks, um, but that's within Zoom. Um, please don't use the chat function, just because sometimes it can be a bit harder for us to keep track of what people have put in the chats compared to the Q&A. Um, we'll attempt to answer questions verbally, so we'll probably read them out uh, so everyone can hear what the questions are, and then give a verbal answer as well. Uh, but if we do run out of time, we'll try and make a record and email those responses around to you. Um, so we're going to have about a 20 minute uh, presentation um, today, um, followed by a Q&A session with the panel, should there be any questions. Um, so the panel today, uh, we have Helen Miller, who's principal planner in the policy and plans group. We've got myself, Adam Harvat, group manager for policy and plans. Catherine Holloway, who's the team leader in policy and plans. We've also got Bash Bodiat, who's uh, helping us co-host uh, this webinar as well. So let me just move on to the next slide. Oh, there we go. So why are we consulting and what is this consultation about? Well, I'm sure hopefully you will, you will already know, uh, but just in case you don't, we're consulting on the local plan update, uh, which will eventually contain a suite of new planning policies to help tackle the climate emergency. This is the earliest stage of consultation known as a scoping consultation. And this is about seeking agreement on broad topics, sorry, on what broad topics should be included in the plan. So we're consulting on ideas and options rather than specific or detailed policies at this stage. Broadly speaking, what we're looking for from this consultation is an understanding of whether people agree with this scope of policies or not, and what your thoughts are on some of these ideas and options. I think most crucially as well, it's about whether you feel that we've missed anything, whether you feel um, that we're being not ambitious enough or too ambitious, um, all of that kind of information uh, would be really useful for us for us to hear. Um, and any kind of evidence or details from your own lives or your own community will be really gratefully received as well as part of the consultation. So we've hosted a series of webinars covering the five different topic areas individually over the summer uh, to help give people a chance to learn about the topics and to ask any questions that you might have. Um, so today's flood risk, as I said, um, we held carbon reduction, placemaking, sustainable infrastructure and green infrastructure webinars over the last couple of weeks. But don't worry if you missed any of those, uh, the recordings are now on, on YouTube. Um, if you have any difficulties in finding them, please just uh, use the uh, our, our web uh, email address, which is at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, we'd be also really grateful for any feedback you have on this webinar. Uh, these are the first series of webinars that we've done as part of the local plan update. Uh, we're keen to make sure that these are as effective as they can be. So any constructive feedback you have for us to improve, please just let us know and use the email address at the bottom of the screen there. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to Helen, who's going to give us our presentation uh, this evening um, on the flood risk uh, topic of the local plan update. So over to you, Helen. Thanks, Adam. As part of our aspiration to make Leeds carbon neutral by 2030, we want to ensure that our communities are resilient to the impacts of climate change. Flood risk is one of the most direct impacts that Leeds faces. So it's really important that we gather up-to-date evidence and plan for the best way to avoid, reduce and mitigate the risk. 
We're not starting from scratch because Leeds already has a good set of policies to help us manage flood risk. But given the climate change forecasts, we are looking at what else we can do within the remit of the planning system. This presentation explains some of the issues and challenges around managing flood risk and some of our suggestions about how we might shape new policy to help deal with these problems. I'm going to explain some of the difficulties we face around planning for new developments in areas with high flood risk, safeguarding land for flood storage, ensuring buildings are sufficiently resilient to flooding, encouraging more sustainable drainage systems, and also we'll take a look at using porous paving in front gardens to help manage flood risk. Next slide, please, Adam. Let's start by looking at some of the rainfall data from recent years. The Met Office statistics show that winters in the UK have got 12% wetter over the last 60 years, and they predict that rainfall is likely to rise by a further 20% by 2070, with an increase in rainfall intensity, leading to 20% more flash flooding. This graph illustrates what's happened in Leeds in recent years, and the rainfall in 2015 was exceptionally high. Some areas of Leeds are prone to a high risk of river flooding, but there are also risks from flash flooding and surface water runoff. Next slide, please. The Boxing Day floods of 2015 resulted in the highest river levels ever recorded on both the River Wharf and the air, notably more than a metre higher than the Great Flood of Leeds, 1866. This is an image of Kirkstall during the Boxing Day floods, 2015. The railway line is underwater and Morrison's and the Kirkstall Retail Park are flooded. They recovered surprisingly quickly, which would not have been possible if homes had been built there instead of retail. But the predicted increases in rainfall could create problems for Leeds and potentially could lead to more people suffering the devastating impacts of flooding. So it's really important that we build the right development in the right place. Next slide, please. Flood risk in the UK is divided into different zones according to the probability of flooding. These flood zones are set by the Environment Agency and don't take account of any defences and they don't include the possible impacts of climate change. Flood Zone 1 has the lowest probability of flood risk and Flood Zone 3 has the highest. Flood Zone 3B is what is known as functional floodplain, where water has to flow or be stored in times of flood. The probability of flooding in these areas is a 1 in 20 year risk or 5% probability. Next slide, please. There are probabilities for both river and surface water flooding. This is a map of the river flooding, river flood risk zones in Leeds. The red and blue areas have a one in 20 year flood risk probability or 5%. This map is out of date now and we're updating it in the strategic flood risk assessment or SFRA to reflect the benefit of the Leeds flood alleviation scheme and latest data from the Environment Agency. The SFRA will also map the extent of the increase in flood risk due to climate change, known as the Climate Change Allowance. Next slide, please. The Leeds Flood Alleviation Scheme, or FAS as it's known, and other schemes will provide some protection for areas in and around Leeds. The Leeds FAS is a scheme for the river air from Woodlesford up to Newlay Bridge. The first section is already constructed and operational, known as FAS 1. This section from the railway station to the Nostrup Weirs has a standard of protection of one in a hundred annual probability of river flooding, including a climate change allowance to 2039, whilst the section at Woodlesford has a one in 200 level of protection. The second section, FAS 2, includes measures that will have the effect of upgrading FAS1 to a 1 in 200 standard of protection, 
and includes a climate change allowance up to 2039 and is looking to identify sacrificial land that is designed to flood, which will further help us to make space for flood water. The council are also implementing flood alleviation schemes on the River Wharf for Otley and on the White Beck and Wortley Beck. But neither national nor local funding exists to provide defences for all the urban areas at risk across the district. Next slide, please. In Leeds, significant parts of the urban area include land in flood zones two and three. So it's inevitable that some development takes place in those areas. We use the government's sequential and exception tests to avo avoid locating inappropriate development in those areas. For example, homes are classed as more vulnerable to flood risk so they are not appropriate in high flood risk areas. The sequential test is used to try to avoid locating the more vulnerable development in flood risk areas. We can only locate homes there when there are no other reasonable alternative sites in the lower risk flood zone. After passing the sequential test, some applications must also pass the exceptions test. This means they have to demonstrate wider sustainability benefits to the community that outweigh the risk. For example, to ensure town centres remain viable. And adequate mitigation must be in place for the lifetime of the development and without making flood risk worse elsewhere. Developers are also encouraged to lay out development so that the open uses are located in the most risky parts of the site and the built development avoids those areas. We want to locate homes close to the services and facilities that people need, whilst avoiding development in high flood risk areas. There is an important balance to be struck between flood risk and other sustainability benefits, such as the need for regeneration, the efficient use of brownfield land and access to services. If policy tests are made tighter to further reduce the number of permissions for more vulnerable development, in flood risk areas. This could result in people living further away from the services and facilities they need. This would then result in longer journeys and add to the emission of greenhouse gases and other polluted gases. As an example, Kirkstall meets a lot of the aspects of a 20 minute neighbourhood, which you may have heard us discussing in the placemaking webinar. The shops and services that people need are generally within a 20 minute walk from where they live, but it also has problems with flood risk. There are other examples in Leeds, such as in Weatherby and Otley. We would like to hear your views on how we can get the balance right between locating homes close to the services and facilities that people need, whilst avoiding high flood risk areas. Next slide, please. Areas of functional floodplain are used for flood storage and we safeguard those areas so that only water compatible uses and essential infrastructure are permitted. Leeds is fortunate that much of the river air as it flows through the urban area will have the benefit of the Leeds flood alleviation scheme and therefore significant parts of the urban area that would have otherwise flooded with a one in 20 year probability will be protected. The SFRA will look at reclassifying those areas so that they are not defined as having a flood storage function. For those urban areas that have a 1 in 20 probability of flood risk, but don't have the benefit of a flood alleviation scheme, the redevelopment potential will continue to be limited due to the high flood risk probability. The SFRA will map the extent of these areas and the impact of climate change. The local plan update may consider the policy options for limiting development in those locations. This is only likely to affect those areas that have a very high level of flood risk and are not protected by a flood alleviation scheme. We would like your views on whether the local plan update should consider limitations on urban expansion in unprotected areas with a very high probability of flooding. 
Next slide, please. When development can't be avoided in flood risk areas, we want to ensure it is constructed to be resilient and doesn't make flood risk worse elsewhere. We ask for details of flood mitigation measures in a flood risk assessment. We are looking at whether the local plan update should set new standards for flood resilient developments, including things like how to provide safe access and egress, and whether there should be any limitations on accommodation for more vulnerable groups, such as older people in high flood risk areas. And we would really like to hear your views on this. Next slide, please. We want to reduce the speed of surface water runoff through the use of sustainable drainage systems or SUDs. That's the kind of flood risk sometimes known as flash flooding. SUDs manage surface water close to where it falls and mimic natural drainage compared to the conventional practice of draining water runoff through a pipe into a sewer. Practical examples include soakaways, which drain water through permeable surfaces into the ground, and ponds, which drain water into a surface water body. This water network is sometimes referred to as blue infrastructure. Suds have lots of benefits and I've listed a few of them here. They improve water quality by reducing pollutants, such as metals and hydrocarbons from roads and car parks. So water entering a local water course is cleaner and does not harm wildlife habitats. They can provide a valuable amenity asset for local residents and create new habitats for wildlife. Any problems with the system are quicker and easier to identify than with a conventional underground pipe system and are generally more straightforward to rectify. Suds can also provide passive cooling which helps to mitigate the effects of temperature rise due to climate change. National policy means that at present, we can't insist on sustainable drainage if the developer can show that a traditional system will be cheaper. We would like your views on how we can make SUDS a firmer requirement for developments. Next slide, please. Paving over a front gardens can increase flood risk when rainwater can't drain naturally because impermeable materials have been used. Also, the loss of vegetation can increase air pollution in urban areas and affect the character and appearance of traditional streetscapes. The intensification of built development through the use of permitted development rights, for example, to build extensions and garages, and the impact of climate change makes it worse. We're keen to explore what approaches we could take to ensure that where landscaping and gardens provide a valuable function in helping manage flood risk, they are not lost through permitted development rights that allow the householder to build extensions, garages or other structures that reduce the extent of the area available for absorption. One of the options may be to provide further guidance for householders on using porous materials when they are planning to convert their front gardens to parking space. We would like to hear your views on this and whether you think the local plan update should consider what approaches could be taken to limit permitted development rights for new developments to ensure open areas that are needed for flood risk management are retained. Next slide, please. We're hoping that you're inspired by this webinar to go into the local plan scoping consultation and complete the questionnaire. You can answer the questions on flood risk, or you can also complete the questionnaires for the other topic areas too. You can find the questionnaires and more info about this on the Leeds Local Plan Scoping Consultation at www.leeds.gov.uk slash LPU or you can email, email us with your comments at lpu at leads.gov.uk. Thank you for listening, and I'll now hand over to Adam to take us through the questions and answers. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, that, that was fantastic. Um, and I hope that was useful to those who were on the call. Um, so now's the time, or at least the opportunity, uh, for you to um, put any questions that you might have, or comments, doesn't have to be a, a question, any comments you might have about what you've heard 
today or things that perhaps you would have uh, you think we should be taking into account that perhaps you haven't seen on the presentation today uh, please uh, feel free to put anything in the uh, Q&A uh, box there and we will do our best uh, to, to answer or respond. Um, if you haven't already, as Helen quite rightly said, please do um, look at the material on our, on our website. There's a lot of information there, um, but we've also tried to make sure that um, the information is in different formats so that people uh, can see things in, in, in ways that suit them. So we've got a few short videos on there as well. Uh, and we've also got shorter questionnaires for people who haven't got much time. Let's say if you've only got sort of three or four minutes and you want to answer some questions, uh, but haven't quite got the time for the more detailed uh, elements, um, you can go and answer summary questionnaires in there as well. So don't be put off if you feel you don't have a huge amount of time, you can still still contribute, uh, although we'd, we'd love your detailed answers as well if you do have the time. So I'll pause just for just for a minute, just in case anybody did have any, have, have any questions. Um, and uh, if we just uh, sit tight, and if we don't have any questions, that's fine. We can uh, finish up early, uh, and otherwise, if we do, obviously, we'll do our best to answer. So I'll uh, I'll stop talking now, and uh, give you a chance to type any questions that you might have. Obviously, if you um, finish today um, and then think, you know, you wake up at two o'clock in the morning and think, I wish I'd have asked uh, this question about flood risk, do not despair because at the bottom of the screen there, you'll see our email address um, and we'll uh, do our best to answer those questions as soon as, as we see them. Um, so uh, please, any questions that you didn't get a chance to ask today, uh, don't worry. And if you're obviously watching this um, on the recording, um, please use um, that, that email address to forward through any questions. Um, and whilst the cons consultation closes on the 13th of September, um, if you do have any questions after that point, that's absolutely fine. Uh, we will still do our best to, to make sure we answer those. Um, so don't worry about um, not answering, you know, making sure that you, you hit that deadline for questions. You're more than welcome to keep on asking us questions. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions in the Q&A, which is absolutely fine. Um, obviously, Helen has knocked out of the park and answered every possible question you could have imagined, uh, which is fine. Um, I'll pause for 30 more seconds, just in case um, anyone was um, typing out um, a long question. Um, I don't want to mean anyone missed the opportunity. So I'll, I'll just pause for 30 more seconds. But if we don't have any more questions, um, that's absolutely fine. Uh, we'll draw the webinar to a close. I hope people got out, uh, out of it what they wanted. Um, and um, then we'll, we'll say goodbye. But as I say, I'll, I'll pause for 30 seconds and, uh, and then we'll close. Okay, so I'm not seeing any further questions. Um, so um, I guess all that remains is for me to say thank you very much uh, to Helen for our presentation. Um, thank you uh, to Catherine and Vash uh, for being here to support. Uh, but more, most importantly, thank you for our attendees uh, this evening. It's very much appreciated for you to dedicate your personal time um, uh, in the evening. Um, so thank you very much. And for anyone who's watching the recording, uh, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, watch this uh, webinar on the uh, local plan update. Um, so this is our last one. Um, so I just want to thank everyone who's been involved. It's been a um, really interesting experience for us. Um, and I hope it's been useful for those who've listened in. Um, so uh, yeah, all that remains is just say good evening and uh, see you all later. So